I had encountered a whole bunch of animals and people that weren't shot that had ex- just literally convulsed and, and died from their own internal organs exploding. I wound up going to the VA, being seen for uh, Gulf War exposure, uh, depleted uranium, and my wife had gotten word of a hearing on this. I thought, I have the moment, and I'm going to say it. I said, well, I have here what's called a PSYOPs pamphlet, and it's covered in a white liquid that and spotted blood from somebody that convulsed their mouth, their stomach came out of their mouth, and their back broke, which is one of the signs of nerve agent exposure to sarin or somin. Okay, wow. so I have that. And I said, and, and last, I know I'm only allowed one question, but... The, the dudes in the $50 haircuts and the no name tags on the uniforms that were taking soil and air samples mm-hmm. when we were in this collection point before going back into Dahran to go home, I'd like to know why they were making us burn all of our uniforms. Uh, I said, I'd like to know those two things. What were they testing for? Mm-hmm. And what the hell is that on that piece of paper? What came of that was a phone call the next day that I'll never forget from Bernard Rotsker's office, Falls Church, Virginia, saying... This is going to be recorded. Mm-hmm. What will make you happy? Wow. And I said, well, well, number one, keep, quit fucking American people yeah. with your wars mm-hmm. and lying and uh, tell the truth. After today's episode, I've realized the only wars that I will ever be cut out for are thumb wars. And even those I probably shouldn't take part in because I think I've lost pretty much every single thumb war. What's up, geniuses? It's the Jubal Show. Thank you for checking it out. As always, Jubal Show comes out every single Wednesday on iTunes and on YouTube. Make sure to rate, review, comment, and subscribe. Then there's the Fresh Till Death podcast, which I do with my hot-ass wife, Alex Fresh. That comes out only on YouTube on Tuesdays. That's where we get high and do stuff. And then the Fresh Till Death podcast again, which I do with my hot-ass wife, Alex Fresh. That comes out on Mondays, iTunes, YouTube, rate, review, comment, and subscribe. Today's episode, I'm going to keep the intro short, first of all. I made that promise to myself and... Without you knowing it, I made the promise to you. Because whenever I do interviews, I tend to have a really, really long intro because I get sidetracked easily, um, ADD or whatever it is, and then I start rambling about whatever it is a lot of times about my indigestion. No indigestion today, though. Not bad. Um, but I don't want to ramble on for like 12 minutes before I get started because today's interview is, is really interesting and something that I have wanted to talk about for a while. Um, Chris Winters is in here today. Well, he's not in here today. He was in here yesterday. I'm recording the intro today. Um, but I, I, I did this interview with Chris Winters, who's a disabled veteran, Native American, uh, labor leader, and is a Selective Service Region 3 board member. Um, I wanted to talk to a disabled veteran and somebody who has been in combat because I wanted to delve into PTSD a little bit. Um, I suffer from complex PTSD from a completely different thing, just a, a, a non-combat PTSD. Um, but over time doing comedy on the road, I've been at bars or I've been at comedy clubs and I have conversations with people after. And anytime I've met a vet who's come home from seeing action in, 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 in the battlefield, I don't, I don't even know. I've, like I'm such a new, I, I don't know. I don't know anything really about the military. And that's why this is so interesting to me. People who watch the podcast and listen might know a lot. I really don't know much. And I always want to find out things. But having done comedy all over the place, I've gotten in more than one conversation, quite a few conversation, conversations with veterans. And I just asked some questions because I'm a curious dude. And one of the questions that has come up is like, what happens? What do they do for you when you get out of the military? And I've always been shocked at how our soldiers are sort of discarded when they get back. Um, because when you see the marketing for all the military and everything else, it says, you know, we're going to set you up with a job. We're going to give you job training. We're going to do all this for you. You're going to go. You're going to serve your country. And then you get back, you're taken care of. And that usually isn't the way it goes. Usually when you get back, the health insurance and coverage that you need isn't really there like it should be. There's kind of no jobs for you. It leaves a lot of guys who are suffering with PTSD and other issues um, with really no place to go. It's like, hey, thanks for going overseas. Thanks for putting your life on the line. Thanks for taking bullets. Thanks for taking shrapnel. Thanks uh, for losing that leg. Um, Farewell. Have fun. Do whatever you do. 
Um, but we, we got what we wanted out of you, and now it's up to you to figure it out. I think things are starting to change a little bit after today's conversation and learning some more, but we still don't do enough for our troops when they come home. Um, and that's what the conversation is about today. You're going to hear some really crazy stories from Chris on things that he experienced while he was serving. And you're also going to hear some really interesting information about what we do do and don't do for our soldiers when they come home. So without going on a big long rant about something and making you wait until we start the interview, today's conversation is really interesting and I think you'll enjoy it even if you if you know what goes on in the military and and, and you understand a lot of the acronyms. There's a lot of like the v, the EVP of the AMD of the WMD, you know, like I don't even know what most of that stuff means, but today's conversation Really interesting, really eye-opening. Hopefully, it can help you um, if you have served and, and you are in need of some help or if you know somebody who has served and in need of some help. Uh, and if not, hopefully, it can just shed some light so maybe you can do your part to help out as well. All right. Uh, without further ado, that's a French word, I think, could be another language. I don't know. But I'm going to go ahead and start the interval here. here start the interval. Start the interview, and that's this is where the rant starts. I'm going to start the interview. Here's Chris Winters. Um, thanks to him for coming on the show. Make sure you rate, review, comment, subscribe. Check out the Jubal Show every single Wednesday, and we'll see you next week for another Jubal Show. But again, don't leave yet. The show's not over. This is the intro part, and then the show starts. So now, now, the show starts. Did I hear you right before we started the podcast? You haven't slept well in 28 years? Since 1992, I had, didn't realize it, but I hadn't slept more than three hours. And yeah. almost, yeah. I, I've actually had people go, dude, I saw you on like line and I talked to you at this time. And, and you then you checked in at work and it's like, wow, I didn't even realize it. Yeah. And I, I call it insomnia by combat. Right. So is, and is, is that a symptom of PTSD? You know, it was 1996. Mm -hmm. I was diagnosed with PTSD. Okay, yeah. And I actually got the the text, not the right. text, but the the page. <laughs> that the page that you <laughs> yeah, had. Yeah, yeah. The VA is really good about that. It's oh, like, yeah. oh, by the way, call us, and it's like, oh yeah, we've diagnosed you with PTSD. Thanks. Oh, thanks. Now what? Yeah. You know, I'm like, like <laughs> what do I do it's now? Like, hold on. <laughs> what, what do you want me to do? Um, it, it was just interesting to me because I overheard you while I was trying to set up um all the podcast equipment. I heard you say that you hadn't slept well and. 28 something years and uh i i obviously have never been in any combat or anything else like that um but i suffer from complex ptsd as well mine stems from abuse as a child and everything else but i also don't sleep very well and i've only recently started sleeping more but i used to get like three hours of sleep and feel fine i didn't like to sleep that much you know so i kind of felt you on that i was like oh okay it's probably a symptom yeah, of so that. you fall under what's what would be considered as trauma-informed programming like yeah uh, well i'm half native american so uh, i'm actually working with a group right now for tribes and for veterans that uh, teaches how to identify trauma-informed programming and how to not you really can't cure it but mm -hmm. how to how to teach people to cope with it yeah yeah and that's kind of one of the things i've been passionate about uh, since I realized uh, why I had all the reactions that I had and everything mm -hmm. else from that. For people listening to the podcast from your mouth, wait, explain what you do and kind of your history real quick, if you could. Um, well, like I said, I was born and raised in Oklahoma. I'm half Native American. I'm an enrolled member of the Muscogee Creek Nation. Um, and as a, without realizing a part of my culture is we're all warriors. And mm. I joined the United States Army, tried the Marine Corps. They said, no, thanks. Um, didn't pay enough, to, enough attention to school, apparently. Really? Uh, yeah, I didn't know that was even a qualifier. <laughs> um, but um, I spent just under 10 years traveling the world through different divisions, different. Uh, I was infantry scout, designated marksman, a nuclear biological chemical warfare specialist. Oh, wow. And then for the needs of the Army. Mm -hmm. Now, that's basically, we've got you, we want you, and we're going to keep you, so you're going to do this. Okay. So that involved a little bit of EOD and uh, some stuff like that. So, so basically it's a classification where it's like, you've done all this other stuff. Yeah. We want you to stick around yeah. just kind of as a utility player for whatever we need. We'll just let you know. 
Yeah, when you get outside of your contract and they've fulfilled their portion, which is what you initially signed up for, you become property mm-hmm. uh, to the extent that even a sunburn is punishable. <laughs> uh, you know, you know, good luck on the tattoos. But um, if your classification is not immediately available, they have the right to place you in just about anything. Wow. Um, that's yeah. that's crazy. So what kind of uh, – I mean, you were involved in – how, how many actions would you say you were involved in? The, I did, uh, unofficially, I did some South American stuff. Um, and then right during the Panama invasion was out here at Joint Base Lewis McCord, then Fort Lewis for a supporting 2nd Ranger Battalion uh, and a scout platoon uh, that was prepped and ready to go. But we weren't called into action down there. Um, the entire division was deactivated, and I was sent to Fort Riley, Kansas, to 1st Infantry Division. Um, and that's where literally the second I signed in that Iraq invaded Kuwait during the first Gulf War. Oh, wow. So it was literally, I looked at my wife and said, don't unpack. <laughs> <laughs> it was pretty close to the truth. It yeah. was we're rapid reaction for then Desert Shield and was there for Desert Storm and then for the mop up afterwards. Wow. And, uh, I mean, how was that experience for you? It was different, you know, being growing up in the South and having held a a rifle pretty much since I was six, Mm -hmm. uh, which is why I got selected for designated marksman. I could pretty much hit anything before getting into the military. Um, It was different. Um, I had been through National Training Center, the Fort Irwin, California, where they teach desert warfare. And oddly enough, you know, took to it like a duck to water. Um, Big thing for me is I had a lot of young men that were just assigned to us at Fort Riley that I had to take over there. And, you know, having to talk to their parents who were just freaking out at mm-hmm. Fort Riley going, you know, please bring my son home. Yeah. It's, what do you tell them? You know, it's like, right. I'm, I'm going to do my best, but you really can't make any promises. Yeah. So just looking after them to make sure that uh, I bring as much of them home as I can. That's got to be a big responsibility, too. <laughs> I mean, well, not, you know. Ha- yeah, not having any kids and uh, – and then having somebody say, this is my child, please bring him home. Yeah. You know. And I'm assuming there's been instances where they didn't come home. You know, no. um, I brought all of mine home. That's not, um, that's good. I brought all of mine home. Some of them with some holes in them. Mm-hmm. Um, a few of them that will be dealing with trauma for a very, well, for the rest of their lives. Yeah. Um, uh, although I was uh, hit and... Um, yeah, I stayed with my unit. I actually had a tilt rod mine go over in the minefield, uh, Lane Bravo, and took me out briefly. But uh, the two gentlemen that actually came in to pull me out got killed shortly after. Oh, wow. Yeah, so, so that, that was kind of You said difficult. that really quick, and I i don't know all the terminology. So what happened? A mine? The uh, If you look, um, I actually still have the cheat sheet, the battalion commander. I was his close quarter security on, uh, on the ALO or Air Force Liaison Track. Uh, they had Lane, Alpha, Bravo, Charlie, and Delta mm-hmm. when the first Gulf War that punched into Iraq during the you know, Norman Schwarzkopf Hail Mary. Uh-huh. Well, we were the first unit to punch through the uh, Republican Guard laid minefields. Oh, wow. Uh, so the cheat sheet that the actual battalion commander had the call signs, fire controls, the whole bit. I, st- I actually still have that. Uh, it should be in a museum somewhere. But we are in Lane Bravo, and the plow tanks would plow through the minefields, mm-hmm. blowing up the small pot mines and anti-personnel mines, and then you would drive through. Wow. Um, I actually had one go off and take out my high-pressure transmission line on what's called a one three personnel carrier okay so under fire uh, we're catching small arms fire from the trenches i've got so you're going you're going through a minefield (laughs) and they're shooting at you and they're shooting at you while you got uh what did you call it? Mine plow? Yeah, yeah a plow tank went in front a of plow us. Plow tank. So they're designed to, to set just off push it out of the to way. push it out of the way. Okay. Yeah. And those are going off, and then you got people shooting at you. <laughs> well, and it made it even worse. We, uh, if you look at a one one three personnel carrier, it's basically like this pop can. Mm. It's high tensile aluminum. An AK forty seven round will go right through them. Wow. I've got like six guys in the back. And this lieutenant that's uh, a grounded F-16 pilot calling in fire for the B-52s. And all I'm thinking about is they're sitting ducks. Yeah. So there's these, uh, when we lost our high-pressure transmission line, I jumped off real quick and dropped the front slope and took a, a really large pry bar. You got to pop the transmission, uh, The uh, it's kind of like your drive line. Okay. You got to pop those loose so you can be towed because okay. we're blocking a lane of travel. Right. Yeah, so right then- when I popped the first one. 
it worked. I swung to the second one, and apparently underneath the vehicle, uh, still stuck in the mud mm -hmm. or the sand, was a tilt rod mine. It rolled over onto its top, wow. and it detonated. Oh, geez. So it blew path of least resistance out from under the vehicle, and I landed about 20 feet back. It felt like Holmes Holyfield and, <laughs> and Tyson hit me in the face. <laughs> yeah. So there, there's this like, really cool photo at the Smithsonian uh, for the warriors in uniform. You'll see a picture of me going like this. Mm. I'm just covered in blood. Wow. And uh, <laughs> it was that was the aftermath. But damn, I got the I got up and ran back and got the other final drive undone and hooked up the tow cable to the 88 vehicle that came to get us. Did you? Do you think it's just like were you just in shock that you were able to still get Adrenaline. up and run? Because I'm like, how? Well, how I only you took one to... through the face, one through the the back of the hand, that scar there, and then mm -hmm. one through the leg. But I wow. didn't even know I was hit. Yeah. So now you... I didn't even know I was hit. Matter of fact, uh, when we got the tow cable on the back of the 88, yeah, you know, talk about a dream sequence. There's this big burly looking vehicle called a recovery vehicle, an 88 mm -hmm. recovery. It comes out of the dust cloud. We're taking fire from everywhere. And I'm thinking, well, this is our last stand. We're gonna we're gonna die here. Yeah. And these guys do like this Rockford Files 180 in this track vehicle, and they back into the lane, and I hook the tow cable up. Jesus. And a big guy like me, I do this end around run mm -hmm. and jump into the side of the vehicle. There's an open hatch. I cleared it, <laughs> and I rolled over on my back. And one of my guys was inside, safe, and he was laughing so hard. He goes, "Holy shit!" He said, oh, "I'm sorry." I said, no, you can swear <laughs> on yeah. this. It's fine. Yeah. He said, "Holy shit." You cleared it. Jesus. <laughs> and I'm laying there and I'm just laughing. And he looked at me and goes, oh, God. Um, yeah. Uh, and he's looking around and this dude pops down from his uh, TC seat, uh, tank, track commander. Mm -hmm. And he grabs his pressure dressing and throws it to him and he sticks it on my face. And I'm like, what? And he goes, nothing, nothing. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, I have a hunk of shrapnel still stuck in my jaw. Wow. But uh, it had cauterized, but I had blood shooting out. And it was, I'm talking to him, and there's this blood. It's like a Monty Python movie. <laughs> I know. I know. I'm sitting there going, you know what? Okay. This is... <laughs> but I didn't even realize until we got to what's called in a, a collection area. So they towed my vehicle to a collection area behind mm. a hill, and uh, artillery was coming in and stuff. So they made us stay put for a second. And the medic came up to me. He goes, Sergeant Williams, he goes, come over here. Let me look at your face. Mm. I'm like, what? And he goes, ah, oh, crap. He goes, your hand. All right. He goes, all right. So he starts doing what's called a battle damage assessment. Mm. And I had blood coming out of my left leg and my left hand and my right. This side had just swollen up really bad. And he's like, wow. okay, well, you just took a hit in the face. And he goes, this is cauterized. And he pulled a hunk out of my leg and wrapped it up. And he goes, we're going to get you over to a dust off, a chopper. And I'm like, I'm good to go. I, I need to get back with my guys. And did, but they sent you out, right? No, you, you, I wouldn't they didn't, go. You wouldn't go. I wouldn't go. And so you went back in. I mean, yeah. And how did that work? Like, uh, <laughs> I'm assuming you we, needed a rest before you did nope. that, or you just went right no, back in. No, I. Uh, they, they the 88 recovery guys are mechanics, and mm -hmm. uh, they had a high pressure transmission line. We dropped the front slope. We put the transmission line on. Uh, we just did a hot refuel, and we got back in the fight. Wow. That's amazing. The, uh, if you look up the uh, 73 Easting or the Battle of Norfolk for during the first Persian Gulf War, mm -hmm. the uh, we were a part of that push through there. Okay. Was, they said it was like the largest running gun battle since Rommel in the desert in World War II. Wow. That's yeah. amazing. But, um, yeah, it was... It, it was pretty intense. The guys yeah. that pulled me out, though, in the 88 vehicle, it was not until, like, the next day that we're in what's called an assembly area mm -hmm. that uh, I was looking for them to go over and thank them. And um, there was what's called cluster bomb units everywhere. Right. The U.S. Air Force had nicely dropped these things everywhere. Mm -hmm. Of course, they didn't tell anybody. The sand had blown over them. And um, one of one of my guys was... Like, hey, um, you know, the mechanics are here. So I stepped out of my vehicle, and just as I did, I looked over, and I saw this dude step out of his, and he stepped on one. And all it looked like was just a mound of sand, and he went flying up in the air, and I'm like, holy shit. Holy shit. We're in a minefield again. Damn. So everybody just froze, and the medics were over there taking care of him. And then I looked, and it was a little green-gray ball with fins on it and a yellow band. Well, green mm. and yellow is high explosive. And I'm like, These, okay. this is American munitions. Oh, wow. 
I'm like, we're in one of our own hasty minefields. So how, everybody backtrack. How, how does that happen? <laughs> it's like <laughs> they drop it out of an airplane and it looks like a hot water heater. Yeah. And then they just disperse. Wow. So you, were, did, you didn't even realize where they were. You're just no, like, the okay. sand had blown over them. So I pretty much got back in the vehicle. We pulled out of there. Well, what had happened shortly after was um, – one of the lieutenants, and I don't even know his name, uh, was working with these two mechanics that had pulled me out, and one of them picked one up. And I apparently the word is is that they asked him, hey, can we hang on to this? And mm. the LT was like, sure. And they no more than turned around, and they were facing each other, and it went off. Wow. It killed both of them. Yeah. But one of them was still alive when we got him to the vehicle. But he, he bled out before we got back to the collection point. Damn. So I lost those two guys. Yeah. But that was that was a that was a really it, it was kind of a defeatist yeah. Yeah, it's, it's like you you just can't call for a you know, somebody to come fix this. Yeah. I mean yeah. when a, a a landmine or whatever explodes in yeah. your in your hands and everything. Yeah. I mean there's nothing you could do. Well, holding it you know, <clears throat> holding it right in front of your chest. Yeah. It's, it's, there's nothing you can do. Yeah, there's I, not a lot you can do there. Did you imagine, I mean, I know, I know when you signed up to be in the military, <clears throat> obviously you imagine that you would have to see some stuff like this and you'd have to be a part of uh, war. Mm-hmm. Um, but were you, were you able to really fathom what it was like before you went? Not really. Because, I mean, but, you, see, you see movies and you see, you know, and, and the stuff that you're explaining to me, Sounds like it's something you'd see in a movie, but uh, but to see that in real life and experience that in real life, like that has to be just fucking heavy. Like I mean, obviously, but well, I mean, how yeah. do you you know how do you cope with how that? Do you process that. Yeah. You know, um, I think I process it probably better than some people because I was only there for that brief period of time. But God, look at look at where we're at right now. Mm-hmm. Nine, uh, 18 years yeah we got 18 years and uh, i was just out on the base today and on a weekly basis i talked to kids that have they grew up and they've never known uh, a world without the u.s being in armed conflict right yeah yeah, yeah. so I mean, it's I, yeah. Yeah. yeah i'm lucky yeah people on the outside yeah. uh civilians wouldn't think about the fact that yeah we've been uh over there yeah. for almost 20 years now yeah and um you know you hear about things here and there but you're not always hearing about what's going on and i'm sure there's things that happen every single day that we're not hearing about you know well they're well we're in djibouti in northern africa the horn of africa syria um we're all over the place um i work with a lot of special operations units uh, second battalion 75th rangers first group special forces and i did a stint with 10th group in germany just and went through their pathfinder lerp course and i know some of those they call them snake eaters but mm. the, the, the guys with the green hats you know and um they're they're real mechanics and their mental capacity to to cope mm. with multiple engagements is uh that's why they're doing what they do but the problem comes when you come home, right? There's there's no bullets flying. Well, unless yeah. you're in South Tacoma or <laughs> downtown Seattle, um, where I'm comfortable, um, oddly enough, and it's quiet. Yeah. yeah, and I think there's a book out called The Evil Hours, and, mm-hmm. and that's exactly what it is. It's when it's quiet. Yeah, and you're not on that head on a swivel. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, yeah. And you you find people that. They've been downrange so many times. They're actually more comfortable there than they are here. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, uh, I want to talk about combat PTSD and kind of what happens when people come home with you. Um, but the parallels between non, non-combat PTSD, people like me, mm-hmm. it's the same thing. Because when things are quiet and when you're not having to be hyper vigilant, and when you're not having to worry and when things aren't chaotic – it feels weird and wrong. And that's when all those feelings start to come up where you're like, I, I don't know how to deal with this. You know, and I, I think unless people can really start to figure out how to cope and how to unwind some of it, but you can't really unwind everything, but how just how to cope and how to get your nervous system back in line um, where you can have those moments and go, everything's going to be okay right now. I'm safe. Um, because yeah, if you've been in experiences like you've been in or, any soldier who's had to deal with that kind of stuff when you come back and it's quiet and you're not you're not in that anymore it's a weird experience and i have talked to a lot of dudes on the road 
doing comedy, which is one of the reasons that um, this topic is interesting to me is because I've done a lot of shows where I've had people come to me after the show and they said that they served and everything else. And, um, and the, the couple of guys have been injured guys talking about PTSD and, uh, and I asked like, Oh, well they take care of you. Right. And according to the guys that I've talked to, it's not what we think. Like they're kind of like, no, they don't really do. We don't get a whole lot done for us. Uh, and I struggle every single day, but I can't, I can't seem to get the help that I need, you know? Um, and that was always disturbing to me because I, I just, I kind of wanted to raise awareness for what it's like for when soldiers come home and have to deal with that. I mean, is that kind of what you found too? I, I did because, uh, well, when I got out, it was far worse than it is now. They, they have gotten better, but the immensity of how long that we've, like you alluded to, that we've actually been engaged in combat, I think that the the enormity of how many people need help mm -hmm. that it's i forgive the expression it's the jiffy lube of treatment <laughs> it's the you know what pull it in shake mm -hmm. the tires clean the windows uh pull the dipstick and then out the door yeah uh, the problem is is when they don't ptsd doesn't and you would know having trauma mm -hmm. yourself doesn't manifest immediately it's like, like a switch is flipped and it's like oh here it is yeah um, yeah with operators and people that have been engaged and, you know, and just at it, it's when things slow down, when it's mm -hmm. quiet, you're not in that, those things start to manifest and then they compound. Mm -hmm. So it's often sometimes years later, like for me, it was literally almost four years later. Mm -hmm. Didn't realize that, you know, sweating profusely at night, not sleeping, being mm -hmm. really quick to, to anger, uh, mm -hmm. drinking a lot. Yeah. Um, where the disconnect comes with the VA system right now, um, and I know some really good folks that work at the VA, but the problem is is the size of the problem. There's, I don't think, enough money to throw at it. It has to come in different uh, facets. Mm -hmm. I actually have a soldier, and I won't mention his name, that um, I actually had a gun store owner that I was purchasing legally a firearm mm -hmm. call me and say, could you call this guy because I'm worried. Oh, wow. And when somebody calls you and says, this soldier that used to do gun work for him while he was an armor in the U.S. Army uh, and is now a civilian, and he calls you and says, would you please call him? I am worried. Yeah. And that's exactly what it was, is he had been to the VA so many times after he got out. And it's this take a ticket and sit in the chair mm -hmm. and being told by a counselor that, you know, this isn't an issue. And here, take these pills. Mm -hmm. when that's not going to solve the problem. Right. Um, it had to be a little bit more holistic than that. So I actually reached out to him, and um, he's actually got his own business now. He's back with his family. He's doing better. He's in Port Orchard, and we talk at least once a week. But that's why soldiers actually help soldiers is yeah. the commonality of understanding that uh, I know where you're at. Right, yeah. 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 And, I mean, that's got to be uh... – I mean, are you just, people know that you try to help. And, yeah. Uh, so they'll just call you and be like, hey, come and, and kind of talk to this guy. Well, I, I kind of created it as my being half Native American, and I really didn't grow up in our way that much. Mm -hmm. But if you think about the Navajo people, the Yavapai, and a lot of our Apache warriors, when a warrior would come home from battle, they would bring bring them home. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, medicine, uh, you know, songs, and, and just get the community would get around them the warriors would get around them and bring their spirit home right right well i not that anybody's like gonna just automatically go well i'm, I'm gonna adopt that um, right. uh, i started adapting some of the things that uh, i self-checked myself into the vet center in tacoma uh in 1996 97 and I put my name, I just drove straight there one day. I knew that there was an issue that I couldn't attack myself. Yeah. I got lucky. I signed the clipboard, sat down, painter's whites, because, you know, I was working with a young man that, uh, yeah. And guy comes out, looks at the clipboard and says, what tribe are you from? And mm. I didn't put nothing down there. He just knew by looking at me. And he was a Klingit medicine man from Alaska. And he was a Marine Corps Navy corpsman. So um, he actually tried to smudge me, and halfway through he stopped, and he goes, uh, the smoke wouldn't even go near you, so we're going to stop now <laughs> <laughs> because you got way too much folks hanging on to you. But the Andy Suspine saved my life. He did. Um, got me to thinking about uh, healing through service. Mm -hmm. 
and pretty much I started dedicating a lot of my time um, either, you know, after work or on weekends to getting back out and volunteering with service members. And then I thought the number one issue that uh, or triage that needs to take place, mm -hmm. and you could probably um, qualify this with what you do. Uh, is the second they get home, get them engaged in something, the, you know, the next mission, if you will. Get yeah. them into a career. Yeah, yeah. And then the spring as it unwinds. They're not going to have, well, I don't have enough money to live. Mm -hmm. The VA doesn't care about me because I don't have enough health care. Mm -hmm. If I can help solve some of those problems and be there, they're going to be around a lot of other vets that are going to help recognize that. So we won't lose as many. Mm -hmm. So I created a... I created what the military now calls a career skills program. Um, I did it without permission, and then when it became successful, um, they kind of wanted to say, well, I guess we're going to do this. <laughs> yeah, that's how it always works, right? Yeah. You're, you're like, no, I know this is going to work. I'm going to do it. And then once it does work, then uh, then then people are like, oh, yeah, no, we want to do that. We will take it. It's fine. 30, uh, 38 bases, 139 programs uh, nationwide. Wow. Um, well, Pat VP or uh, Painters and Allied Trades Veterans Program. Uh, then there's the UAVIP program that they started with the plumbers and pipe fitters, the Sheet Metal Smart Heroes, uh, and then other CSPs have started Microsoft, MSSA, or Apprenti. Um, we're on the base, out of joint base, every Monday doing a CSP brief. I had 95 people on Monday from Colonel major private air force coasty sitting in a room uh just wanting to hear about what can i do when i get out well, yeah and because what there are really other than this program that now you've mm -hmm. spearheaded and created mm -hmm. uh before that what happens when you are done serving what what's typically what would happen well, the when I got out, there was a civilian with a beard and a book. The book was, what color is your parachute? He said, that's what a computer looks like. Thanks for your service. Oh, and by the way, we paid you too much money. You need to pay that back. So I left Fort Riley, Kansas, 1st Infantry Division, because nobody told me my home of record when I first signed up in the Army years before was Oklahoma. Uh -huh. But I wanted to move to Washington State. So okay. they said, well, travel from Fort Riley, Kansas mm -hmm. to Tulsa, Oklahoma is $256. Okay. You want to go to Washington State? Good luck. I drove back here on fumes. So and, and so, pork and beans. <laughs> <laughs> so, so they go, okay, so you're back and you're like, uh I don't want to live in the city that I was was yeah. uh, living on base or yeah. post or whatever the correct term is, excuse mm -hmm. me, but uh, I want to live over here mm -hmm. and you had said um, what was it again? I'm sorry. Yeah, if you don't change what's called your home of record when you when decide you, to get out, uh -huh. before you get out, uh, they will only pay you for travel to so, that home of record. So they just would give you enough money to go there, but you wanted to yeah. go to Washington yeah. State, which is a lot more. Yeah. And there's no way to go, hey, <laughs> I want to change that. or uh, They're yeah. just like, no, this is what yeah. you get. And what you said you mentioned something about them also saying, oh, by the way, we paid you too much. You owe us? How? Yeah, apparently Denfoss, Defense Finance, said that sometime while I was in um, um, Dahran, which is where our collection point was after the first Gulf War was over, mm -hmm. we had to clean up all of our vehicles and pressure wash them, get them free of sand flies, and God help you if you ever get into sand flies. Those what things, are, what are, they're, they're unforgiving. They're really? triangle flies that will take hunks of meat out. Oh. Imagine a horse fly on steroids. Oh, my God. Yeah, they yeah. and it's just unforgiving. Um, so they didn't want any of those getting back to the United mm -hmm. States and crossbreeding with any of our animals, you know, right? Our yeah. little arachnids. And, <laughs> but, um, yeah, I uh, apparently they said we overpaid you at some point uh, while you were there, almost $1,000. So you get it, you know, so I'm getting out with no money. Mm -hmm. uh, I've got my wife and I had a, an apartment full of stuff. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, we had a really big yard sale. We sold everything we could. I put a laundry basket, a rifle that I had, and some clothing in the back of an old Camaro and that's all we left with. Wow. Otherwise, I wouldn't have had the gas money to drive back here. Yeah. 
Damn, that's crazy. Yeah, don't put candles on top of your clothing when you're driving from Kansas during the summer through <laughs> Wyoming. It's my wife. <laughs> Ruined yeah, everything. She, she goes, I'm, I don't know where those candles went. I said, I do. They just glued everything together. After that, you're like, I'll go back to combat. Yeah, I'll, I'll go back to right combat. Now. I'll just do that. <laughs> um, so, so you get out, and this was before, you know, there's been things started to be put in place, I guess, but you get out, and they're just like, all right. Here's here's what you owe us. Here's the money to move to where you wanted to move to, or at least the travel to get there. Um, but that's it. Other than that, yeah. And it's on you to figure out what to do next. Absolutely, uh, and it has gotten better. Uh, they make you now. When when you get out, you do what's called clearing. You're given a list of places you got to go check the box. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't owe you money. Here's all your equipment back. Oh. I'm sorry I used it and it's broken. Oh, okay, I got to pay for it and fix it. Crap. You have to pay for, like, if you have equipment that breaks? <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> unless, like... unless you tag it combat loss and you're able wow. to get that done, you, oh, yeah. Well, you're only issued originally uh, a set of uniforms, and then after that, you have to buy them. Really? You're given an allowance every year for wow. clothing allowance, but sometimes it just doesn't quite match what you, yeah. you got to have. I mean, so, and that, that's like the thing to me that yeah. that's so strange is when I learn things like that, because from somebody who has really had no experience um, other than watching movies with the armed forces at all, you would think that all of the, the necessities that you need to serve are just supplied to you. Like <laughs> no matter what, your uniforms are good. You, you, don't, you, you wouldn't think you'd have to pay for that. Like if I work for a company and I'm a janitor and I have to wear a janitor's uniform every day. They're going to supply me with that uniform, most likely. You know, you, you would think, yes, the, the military supplies it. They supply this much, and then if you need it, you got to requisition it, wow. and the money's got to be there to buy it. Um, I remember being in uh, outside of Al Safwan, Iraq, in the Wadi Al Batin, which is basically a dry riverbed, and we were waiting in one place to say go to Baghdad, or and every, everybody was just in the holding pattern. And our battalion commander, he was a French Creole, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Gregory Fontenot. He was a man about practicality, so he had us all pull off in hasty D, and uh, just in case something went down. And he said, we got to keep the guys engaged. Mm. So we towed some damaged vehicles up there, and we set up some Olympics of, you know, blow that crap up, <laughs> shoot that shit, and uh, grab, you know, as much ammo as you can and run through the desert with a mouth full of water. You know, he's all about, hey, the Apaches did it. <laughs> but um, we cut a water buffalo in half and turned it into a big bathtub for him. And he's sitting there with a cigar and a Kevlar, and in flies a helicopter. And everybody's got worn uniforms. There's holes in them. The crotch mm-hmm. is blowing out. Shoes got, you know, they're flopping. And mm-hmm. and this lieutenant gets off the chopper. She's got a brand new uniform, nice fresh boots. <laughs> and she's come strolling up to this water buffalo. And he's a short, stocky, like me, an out of shape guy. <laughs> he stands up and he's like, LT, if you pull up into my motherfucking AO again, wearing a uniform like that, you didn't bring anything for my people, I will shoot that bird out of the sky. <laughs> <laughs> wow. You better bring some shit to my house. <laughs> yeah, I'll, seriously. Because some of us actually had duct tape, you know, 100 mile an hour tape holding our soles on our Jesus. shoes. That's crazy. Yeah. You don't think about that. Like, hey, you, you know. Well, you wear it out. I yeah. Mean. I mean, obviously, but you don't think that yeah. you don't think that you'd need to be duct taping your boots. Yeah. You know? <laughs> it's, it's, or, you know, it's, uh, you know, that's why they call it 100 mile an hour tape. You put it on, you can still go 100 miles an hour. <laughs> zip ties, 100 mile an hour tape. <laughs> zip ties are amazing, by the way. I love I, zip ties did it (laughs) um okay so but now though you're you're helping to get guys uh started off on a path when they get back it has become a really interesting holistic uh form of treatment that i think they finally got their hands around and i'm just trying to keep them from mucking it up Mm -hmm. uh it's pretty simple we had a battalion a a base commander a uh, Colonel uh, Chuck Hodges, who's now a civilian, he works with U.S. Chamber of Commerce, Hire America's Heroes. Um, he said the NJS, the No Job Syndrome, and I corrected him and said the NCS, No Career Syndrome. Mm-hmm. The job is a one-time thing. He and Colonel Davitt from the Air Force, they jointly spearheaded with uh, Miss Amy Morash, that is now the uh, Chief Advising Officer for Army uh, Education Programs, that a lot of the other branches are looking at. 
they're putting a lot of time and money into trying to help them find their next career before they get out. Because if you think if you don't have money for food, living, uh, and to sustain your family, uh, military suicides are number one. Right. Uh, construction suicides are number two. So trauma-informed programming and suicide prevention uh, has become a, a real issue with how do we address um, these folks coming home and just mm-hmm. taking some of that stress away. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and that and that's something that I hadn't heard before, but I mean, it's obviously, it makes sense, especially with, you know, me understanding that world of having trauma, um, having something to do, you know, because if you get back and you're dealing with all these things and you don't have a job or a career and you're going to, you're going to go down a, a bad path for sure. Cause there's no other way for that energy to go. You it's know? those evil hours. Yeah. It's, it's the worst thing is when you think that nobody understands what you've been through mm-hmm. and that nobody is there to, and it's a slippery slope. Um, and then when you believe that they're better off without you mm-hmm. and, yeah. and then now add alcohol or drugs, mm-hmm. Uh, and you got two choices. Uh, I'm still staying in contact with some of the service members that I was counseling, you know, unofficially, but mm. uh, helping them get into a career. And then I lose track of them, and then I get a Facebook message, and they're back. They're yeah. back in the uniform, or they're in a civilian uniform back down range as a contractor mm-hmm. because they miss. I think um, Matt Best did this on YouTube, and it was funny. Um, they sang a song. It's a parody, but it's actually true. I can't believe we missed this shit <laughs> is what it's called. <laughs> yeah. and, and it's actually true. You miss that teamwork. You miss that uh, I'm downrange with you. We're yeah. shoulder to shoulder. Mm-hmm. Um, you understand me. I understand you. And we have some really dark humor. <laughs> I I have to apologize to people because, you know, being in public life, I try to wear long sleeve shirts. I'm covered in tats right. and uh, scars. And when um, I'm thinking about it, I say it in my head before I say it out loud, because um, when something happens, I mean, I find humor in some of the darkness because oh. that's, that's how you survive. Yeah, me too. Like I, I dark humor is, you know, <laughs> it's where I, it's, I mean, it's what I enjoy the most. Uh, some people don't don't appreciate it as much, but yeah, I mean, when you've had to deal with dark things and you've had you've had no. you know you've gone through some stuff, like you can find humor. That's actually very helpful for me to be able to laugh at certain things, like even yeah. things that have happened to me. Like writing jokes about them is, is therapeutic and it helps. You well, know, being a comedian, you you actually um, uh, you're you're doing what I, I. If you meet anybody that's known me, they're gonna say, "Oh, great!" He says, "If you're laughing, you're breathing. You're breathing. You're living." <laughs> And I'm yeah. like, ha, I got you. <laughs> ha, ha, I got you. I'm like Mel Brooks, I love Mel Brooks. He's, oh, Mel Brooks was like, amazing, yeah. I met him at a distance. I did the, did Param- really? I did the Paramount Theater Restoration in 96, 97. And uh, Ida, when she got it uh, as a landmark, they Miss Saigon was the first show. And Mel actually came there. Um, I got to see him at a distance. And I'm like, oh, Miss, Mr. Brooks. Yeah. yeah. You know, he was hilarious. <laughs> um, one thing that you touched on uh, – uh, you talked about uh, soldiers and, and suicide and just mm-hmm. suicide in general. Mental health is a big thing for me, obviously. I mean, I wouldn't want to talk about this stuff if, it, if I didn't yeah. care about it and want people to hear about it, the things that go on. Um, but you you made a point that I try to touch on whenever anybody talks about suicide because mm-hmm. I've been there and I've tried. Uh, and I don't think I'll ever be back there again, thankfully. Yeah. But through work and through figuring out why, you know, but, uh, whenever somebody does commit suicide, you hear people say, um, people that don't understand that mentality say how selfish of them. Hmm. And I've always responded because that's, it's always bothered me because I was like, actually it's very cold and insensitive to say that because imagine being in such a place where you feel like everybody is better off without you you're actually in your mind doing a selfless thing. You're like, mm-hmm. everybody, I'm a burden on everybody. I need to, I, like, I'm ruining their lives. And it's all, a lot of it mostly is imagined, you know? And if I were just gone, everybody would be better. I'm going to do this for them so they have to stop dealing with me. That's kind of the attitude that it is. And so I always like to tell people um, whenever I get a chance, like, it's not to say that it's selfish, really 
belittles how dark it is to be in that headspace. And then you hear about uh, people with PTSD and specifically like we're talking about soldiers coming back and being in that headspace and then people not understanding and not trying to uh, put programs in place to help them. It it made me sad when I was, uh, the, the couple times that I've had these conversations after comedy shows I've, like I was talking about, I couldn't believe um, the things that these guys are telling me, like about how they struggle every day. They don't have jobs. They can't, you know, there's nothing there to help them. Um, and, and, and I couldn't believe it. I honestly was just shocked, you know, it's, you're absolutely right. It is really selfish for other people and cold for them to not put themselves in that headspace and go. And I, I've been there, you know, I, I broken home, alcoholism beaten all the time. I was the step kid. Mm-hmm. Um, that was an actual thought in my mind in the middle of high school, living in my grandmother's house that nobody wanted me. This was the worst place for me to be. And I was really fortunate that, um, I think there was something telling me that there's, there's a, a light on the horizon. I got really friggin' angry Mm -hmm. and I was mad at everybody around me for actually not, not knowing that I was in this, in this situation. Um, and it didn't get to the point to where I was actually saying, you know what, this is going to happen. I'm just going to remove myself from the equation and fuck them all. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I got so angry at him. I said, you know what? No, you know what you're going to do tomorrow morning? I'm going to get up. I'm, I was going to school. I work four jobs and, uh, I was literally living by myself in my grandmother's house while she was in recovery for a surgery. And um, I said, you know what, fuck them. I'm going to school tomorrow. I'm going to go to work. If they want me out of this life, they're going to have to kill me. But they better make sure they do it because I'm coming back. And the second I walked out of that house that next morning, this dude comes out of the house across the way. And he's kind of a gangly, young, um, uh, Harrison Ford-looking guy. Mm -hmm. Had a fedora on, too. And I was like, holy crap. (laughs) And uh, Wes, Wes Surratt. And he goes, hey, I've seen you around the neighborhood. I just want to introduce myself. We became best friends. Um, I think I was supposed to meet this guy. Uh, I buried him last year after uh, he was in the Persian Gulf. And he, ironically, he worked on helicopters and all those uh, chemical plumes and everything they went through. He contracted some form of cancer. Wow. But, uh, yeah, I, I buried my mother, my little brother, who, Navy, alcoholic and they kicked him out under an re4 they knew he had a problem what's a re4 re4 is you can't re-enlist and it's not dishonorable uh-huh. but he it, at 40 years old he died died of diabetes wow yeah 40 <laughs> yeah so no there's no problem there but i buried those three last year <laughs> and i'll tell you um, i was looking over my shoulder going if the guy with the scythe is behind me just nod <laughs> i'm gonna check his ass and then i'm gonna continue to move <laughs> but um it is people that have not been in that headspace doesn't yeah. don't understand no. you're you're in your mind i'm making a selfless act i'm mm-hmm. removing me as a problem from your life yeah. i'm the problem yeah and i'm gonna get rid of the problem uh, to make everybody else happy anger's what saved me yeah yeah just just absolute anger that you know what if you want me gone so much bring Mm -hmm. it bring it because you better bring friends this is not a sandwich it's a picnic yeah yeah i mean it and that's the kind of thing that you have to do is like draw on something you know uh and thankfully you had anger to use in that (laughs) moment um you, you talked real quick about the uh chemical clouds and stuff like that that it was something else I wanted to touch on. I, I don't want to keep you too long. We, no, no, remember, but, um, but I know that there's a lot of things that happen like that too with soldiers. So like you'll be out uh, serving and there's chemicals that you don't know what they are. And then I've heard also that um, they'll be like, here's some medication. You don't <laughs> really know what it is. You know, like oh, I do. Okay, so did that 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 kind of that happens? Actually, yes. Well, imagine if you will, you're being told that your personal protective equipment, your gas mask, and your weapon Mm -hmm. never leaves your sight. Never leaves your sight. If you do, it's an Article 15. They write you up. Uh They actually shut an entire base down if they lose one of these things. Wow. So you're downrange. You're in the desert before the balloon goes up and and you're you're engaged in combat and you're told leave your weapon and your your uh, gas mask on the vehicle and report to this tent Mm -hmm. what the hell 
Like I'm not supposed no, to. No, no. Yeah. You know, and you get to the tent and there's a guard with a rifle standing outside and a medic that you broke bread with and that I've played, you know, uh, tag football with, mm-hmm. you know. Um, I won't mention his name, but he wouldn't even look me in the eye. And he gives me a shot and then he hands me a tablet or a pack of tablets, a pyrostigma bromide and PB tabs, basically. And the shot he gave us, we weren't told what it was. Wow. But all I know is that I didn't. Yeah, I didn't shit for like two weeks. I pissed green. That's greener than that wall over there. Wow. And I could not sleep. I find out years later that it was an experimental, um, basically nerve agent antidote to try to block your nerve endings so that uh, and I, I did a stint in nuclear biological chemical warfare yeah, school in Germany. Yeah. So uh, VG, VX, sarin, soman, nerve agents, you know, they have mm-hmm. like nine specific symptoms and, uh, you know, we weren't told any of that stuff. It didn't show up in our medical records. And then all of a sudden, you've got people coming home that are having birth defects with yeah. their kids, skin yeah. rashes. Um, I saved, well, you know, hey, designated marksman, I, I, I take good records. I saved actually some of those tablets. I made notes and what have you. And um, oddly enough, I took a ton of photos with a, one of those little wind-up cameras. And I didn't, de- they had this little thing over there in the port. You could develop your photos for a buck a roll. Uh-huh. Oddly enough, you never got your negatives or photos back. <laughs> um, I put a bunch of them in an ammo can and put mm-hmm. them on my vehicle, and I waited until I came home and had them developed. That's smart, yeah. Um, there was Senator Patty Murray was holding the uh, Go For Illness hearings. I just wanted to hear what was going on, and there was some really heinous testimony going on about people that were holding up photos of their loved one mm-hmm. that had died, and then here's a... Uh, you know, a, an actual, uh, what's it called? A physical examination that was signed off and done like six months after they had passed. Wow. So, you know, when my testimony came up, it was, Hey, and, uh, I told her, so I wound up going to the VA being seen for, uh, Gulf war exposure, uh, depleted uranium. And my wife had gotten word of a hearing on this mm-hmm. at joint base Lewis McCord, then Fort Lewis. And my doctor was a panelist at this hearing. Mm -hmm. So when I went to the doc that week, I went once every four months. I said, hey, do you know about this hearing coming up? Oh, no. No, No, that's just a a little thing that they're doing. And, yeah, no, that's not a big deal. Right. So I actually went and sat in the audience, and he caught me looking at him from up in the crowd. He would not make eye contact. Yeah. I kept raising my hand to get the microphone. <laughs> like, hey, motherfucker. He wouldn't bring it. Some old <laughs> dude stood up and got the mic and brought it to me. And, wow. And I looked him in the eyes, and I and I started to call him a lion son of a bitch. But mm. I thought, I have the moment, and I'm going to say it. I said, well, I have here in this, in this hermetically sealed bag what's called a PSYOPs pamphlet, and it's covered in a white liquid. That and spotted blood from somebody that convulsed their mouth, their stomach came out of their mouth and their back broke, which is one of the signs of nerve agent exposure to sarin or soman. Okay, wow. so I have that. So it's a pamphlet with that. It's, yeah, they dropped psyops. Basically, they drop these uh, containers that punch hmm. out leaflets that say in language of your country, uh, you do this or this is going to happen to you. Okay. And then there's a picture on the other side. Okay. So when you see folks surrendering and they're holding these little pieces of paper, yeah, that's the, if you don't put your weapon upside down or just leave it and mm-hmm. come carrying a white flag, we're going to fucking kill you and your family. Wow. Um, so, so by saying you ha- had that with... I had encountered a whole bunch of animals and people that weren't shot, that had ex- just literally convulsed and, and died from their own internal organs exploding. Wow. So I, I took a bunch of photos. And then I secured some of the material, and I actually brought it home with me. And it was interesting to see the faces on the panelists when I said, oh, it's in a hermetically sealed bag. I have this. <laughs> and I said, and, and last, I know I'm only allowed one question, but the, the dudes in the $50 haircuts and the no-name tags on the uniforms that were taking soil and air samples mm-hmm. when we were in this collection point before going back into Dahran to go home, I'd like to know why they were – making us burn all of our uniforms. They gave us new uniforms because they wanted us to look good. I know because I had holes in my fingers from sewing patches on my colonel's uniform. Wow. Uh, I said, I'd like to know those two things. What were they testing for? Mm -hmm. And what the hell is that on that piece of paper? 
and they said, well, we'd like to talk to you in the hallway. <laughs> what came of that was a phone call the next day that I'll never forget from Bernard Rotsker's office, Falls Church, Virginia, saying, this is going to be recorded. Mm -hmm. What will make you happy? Wow. And I said, well, well, number one, keep, quit fucking American people yeah. with your wars mm -hmm. and lying and uh, tell the truth. There was chemical agents. We detonated them in Camasilla. Mm -hmm. There's a CIA report that was released that said, oh, by the way, the Iran-Iraq war, this is shit that we sold them. And we were in what's called the EDM, the Effective Downwind Message. Wow. And they kind of hesitated. And I said, yeah, I know what an EDM is. <laughs> That's when you blow shit up and the wind's blowing that way. This is ground zero. And then it's depleted this much when it goes that direction. Wow. So thanks to then President Clinton, they funded a Gulf War study where they were like, well, we're not going to admit that you guys were exposed to anything. Mm -hmm. But if you were in that plume. Uh, we're going to continue to monitor and test you. And just see. We'll just watch. We're just going to see. <laughs> yeah, 27 years out. later, a shitload yeah. of people have died, and that's yeah. that much less. Does it sound like Agent Orange to you? Does uh, it sound like yeah, a little bit. Yeah, let's yeah. wait until enough of you die, then we'll wow. actually admit to this going on. So now it's burn pits. Mm -hmm. You know, burn everything you have and then live in the smoke. Wow. Uh, and we're having our men and women from OIF and OEF coming home. So... But the cool thing is, is our training programs that we get them into, like Pat VP, mm -hmm. we have full family medical, dental, and vision. God help them if they had to just rely on the VA. Yeah, I mean, especially when stuff like that's happening, you know. Yeah, you're, you, you, uh, you uh, were smart enough. I don't even know smart enough to term, but you th had enough forethought to be like, I'm going to save this stuff. Mm -hmm. I'm kind of pissed off about this and the way that we've been treated, uh, and I'm going to ask some questions. And props to you for doing that. You know, because a lot of people don't. And then you come back and uh, you've been exposed to chemicals, everything else, and then you don't have enough health care to try to deal with it. Uh, so for anybody listening to and watching the podcast today, uh, is there a way that they can help um, you and, and what you're doing? I mean, there there is. I tell a lot of the vets, and this is something you're going to run into and you probably already have. A lot of them don't go to the VA and register. Um, you know, they're they're given a briefing when they go to get out. They're like, you know, I don't need those benefits. I'm not going to go do this. Mm -hmm. If they don't know who you are and then when down the road when you need those benefits, it, it's going to be harder for you to get into it. Go to the briefing. Do your CNP, your compensation pension exam. Um, and if, you know what, if, if it's down the road that something happens god forbid that it does it's going to make it that much easier on your current employer's health care plan mm -hmm. like at our our union i'm a union member our health care costs you know go through the roof if we don't if we have unchecked illnesses that could have been controlled early on mm -hmm. well if you have health care and you're also using your va they split the cost so, you know, it's great that we have these employer employee, you know, utilized health care plans. But think about it. It'll alleviate some of the cost on the VA's budget if you have that type of co-participation. So I tell vets, you're not taking something away from someone. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like the old adage when they, you know, they used to knock on your door in Germany. You know, hey, we got a it's the end of the month and not enough people are eating in the mess hall. Just sign your name to this thing so we can turn in a full sheet of names. <laughs> Right. And so because they were getting rations based off of full sheets of names. Wow. Um, and sadly, if you're the only way they're going to improve health care with the VA or the choose VA mm -hmm. where they're farming stuff out to private uh, practices and physicians is that they can show that there's an increased need for its use. OK. Yeah. So. Uh, so, I mean, yeah. that's valuable knowledge and uh, that helps a lot, you know, and and, and you know. Um, thank you for what you're doing because uh, I'm sure it's helping save a lot of people. You know? And the, the one thing that I would leave them with, and I know you do, is there are, you know, there's employers out there that want to hire you. Yeah. Don't live in the stigma that I'm broken, I'm mm -hmm. damaged goods, nobody wants me. You know, um, what is it? Uh, um, it's the Soldier Family Assistance Center or SFAC. You go to JBLM, you go to the WTV, the Warrior Transition Battalion, you go to SFAC. There's men and women coming in there that are either combat injuries or just physical stress injuries or, you know, mental mm -hmm. stress issues. Yeah. They're recovering. They're not broken. No. Uh, if anything, the, they're tempered and they're really good and potential employees. And I tell folks all the time, 
you know, you want to hire them, get with the program. Mm -hmm. uh, you go to jblamunlimited.com and you can post a hiring fair or I'm looking for yeah. um, and go there. But um, it just, you know, it's not a hand up, it's a handout. Right. You know, it's not a hand up, hand out, hand it's up. a hand up. Hand up. Yeah. Other way, yeah, <laughs> dyslexic. Um, but do that because I'll tell you, um, we've had a lot of men and women that have transitioned to our trades and I'm proud that my very first ever one, he has his daughter, he's got his wife, he's in California, he's a journeyman painter, Sergeant Nick Mead, now Nick Mead, mm -hmm. out of District Council 36, and they just did an article in the paper on him, and he's coaching his daughter's, you know, basketball team, he's in the, the soup kitchens helping out. That's awesome. He's healing through service. Yeah, yeah. Right. Healing so. through service. That's another thing that, uh, that I've, uh, I've had therapists say to me and everything else is like, when you struggle with... PTSD and things like that, healing through service, start doing things for other people. It will, it will help you in certain ways. I will have to say this though. I, I didn't coin that phrase. There is a, there is a gentleman around here, a, a former Marine Sergeant Quinones, Aaron Quinones. If you look up Q missions, um, he's a great guy. They do uh, boating for heroes. Um, but, um, uh, he actually wrote a book called healing through service. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, and somebody turned me on to him and they said, Hey, you got to meet this dude. And I'm like, oh, this Marine, great, wonderful. <laughs> <You know? laughs> like, All right, yeah, whatever. But uh, <laughs> great, great guy. But uh, he gave me a draft copy of the book, and I had it in my car. I was getting ready to read it. And a dear friend of mine, uh, she had rotated back from Afghanistan, and her best friend committed suicide. Wow. Um, we had coffee, and I could see in her eyes that there was something horribly missing mm -hmm. and that she really needed an answer. So I thought, hey, do me a favor. I got this book in my car, and it's just going to come up missing. Could you? I know you like to read. Could you read it and then tell me what you think about it, so I can actually, when I read it, have a maybe an advanced thought. Hmm. She still has it. Wow. Um, she's actually was the executor of her friend's estate, and uh, she has set up a, a trust to where she's going to start being able to help people through that tragedy. And she actually smiling now. Wow, that's great, man. So she's living it, you know, yeah. and uh, and it's going to be a struggle. But, you know, guess what? Every yeah. day. Every day is a struggle. That's right. But <laughs> you find the little highlights from it. Yeah. And, you know, every day can also be great, too. You can have both at the same time. Yeah. Um, thank you for coming by the podcast, dude. I appreciate it, man. And thank you for all you're doing and have done. Oh, thank you. I, I look forward to, to hearing you a lot, a lot more. And uh, I, I want to thank you personally for, you know, doing what you do for, for service members. Yeah, definitely. And, uh, thanks thank again. You. Yeah, thank you.